Hello, this is Dr. Michael Trax, or Michał Trax, if you can follow my Polish pronunciation. And here's an update on the coronavirus situation as of March 12, 2020. There are two groups of people I would like to address in this video. Those who continue to feel the current measures are an overreaction to basically a bad case of flu, and those on the opposite side of a spectrum whose growing anxiety is becoming overwhelming. This is a crisis that cannot be underestimated, that will change the way we do things for a while, but that will pass, affecting you less than you think. Please allow me to explain. Let us address those of my friends who feel that this is an overreaction first. This is ridiculous, they say. The flu kills 100 patients a day in America, and no one is reporting about that. This is a media circus that is getting out of control. Though I agree that some media outlets are mishandling their reporting here, allow me to explain why the underlying concern is warranted and why COVID-19 is a real threat. To understand how dangerous a virus is, you have to look at two parameters its transmission potential, i.e. how likely it is to spread to other people, and case fatality rate, or how likely it is to kill. First, let us talk about transmissibility. There is a number in epidemiology called the basic reproduction number, or R0, which denotes transmission potential of the virus. Put another way, it tells us how many people can get sick from an infected case. At the moment, the best estimate we have is coming from China, and it stands at 2.2. One sick patient can infect 2.2 other people on average. For the flu, the R0 is substantially lower and stands at 1.3. Now, I saw a neat graphic that's circulating widely and placed the flu at roughly the same R0 as the SARS-CoV-2, and I think information as such is confusing people. Graphics are nice, but you should trust and verify. So here's the definitive data on the issue. A 2014 systemic literature review examining 567 papers on the subject. As you can see, Spanish influenza's median art knot was 1.8 and seasonal flus is 1.28. For the record, SARS-CoV-2 has a much higher potential to infect than the flu. So, what is the difference between R0 of 1.3 and 2.2? It has to do with something called the doubling time the amount of days it takes for the number of infected cases to double. As illustrated by this mathematical model graphing a theoretical outbreak, R0 of 1.3 gives you a doubling time of about 11 days, whereas R0 of 2.2 makes it closer to 2.5 days. That is a huge difference as it could be seen here. So as you can see, although both the flu and the SARS-CoV-2 virus have a potential for spread, SARS-CoV-2 has a much greater potential to do that. Predicted doubling times can be affected by many variables such as susceptibility of the population and instituted control measures, so the overall average of SARS-CoV-2 currently stands at about 6.4 days, but that includes China, which is now getting this thing under control. Outside of China, things do not look as good. So yes, there are many more flu infections present at the current time, but this is not about the now. This is about 5 or 10 doubling time periods from now. Please remember, Italy went from case number 1 on January 31st to full closure of the country on March 9th, 38 days and 12,000 cases later. And it is not about the 12,000 cases of coronavirus that closed Italy. After all, it had 2.5 million cases of the flu in 2017. It is that with the unchecked spread and the current Italian doubling time of 4 days, we could have many, many more cases in a month. America's current doubling time? Now, I will grant you an important concession about that growth rate. That first Italian case on January 31? We all know that's not really true. We understand that there is a lag between the viral entrance into a community and the first cases being actually reported. It takes time for enough people to get sick and for a system to recognize coronavirus outbreak. By the time the first case is reported, there are often hundreds already infected and as testing ramps up, so does the count. That is why we went from one law in Westchester on March 3rd to 216 cases in New York State on March 12th. Did these 216 cases all get infected in the past several days? No, most of them were here before and the only way we know about them now is because we tested them. So although the current doubling rate in the US is scary, with over a thousand cases present all of a sudden, that is because we are now simply catching up with the testing. 
But please understand that even if we go to the more conservative average Chinese figure of 6.4 days doubling time, unchecked, this virus will grow exponentially and reach proportion higher than the flu. That is why we need to do all we can do to stop it. So for once and for all, for all the folks who tell me there are estimated 34 million cases of flu in the United States, with 350,000 hospitalizations and 20,000 attributed deaths so far this season, I'll say this. Flu is a horrible illness that has been chronically underestimated by the general public. I had patients die of the flu and fear it more than anything else since it kills kids, which COVID-19 does not. These numbers are scary, and I hope it will motivate you to vaccinate your loved ones next year. But do not look at the low current COVID count and follow what is called the exponential growth bias, a very normal and human inability to intuitively feel for the implications of exponential growth. In other words, do not be like the king in the Indian rice chess legend, the most famous parable to challenge this bias. In the legend, a traveling sage was asked to play chess with a king. One and asked for a very modest reward, a few grains of rice in the following manner. The king was to put a single grain of rice on the first chess square and double it on the next. It started innocent at first, one case here, two there. By the eighth doubling period, there were 128 grains of rice on the board. No biggie, said the king, just a fistful of grains. You can see what happens next. On the 21st square, one million grains were needed, and it was only the beginning. You get the rest. This is the power of exponential growth. These are the COVID cases growing exponentially. In a population without immunity, there is nothing short of significant public health measures to stop the growth and the current absolute COVID numbers can quickly come and surpass the flu. And that's just the first half of the story. The other half is the severity of illness. Simply put, COVID-19 is a more serious disease than the seasonal flu. CDC's numbers estimate 20,000 flu deaths this year out of 34 million for the fatality rate of 0.06%. This often gets rounded up to 0.1% average case fatality rate. Now, case fatality rate, or CFR, is the next important concept to understand. CFR is represented by total of deaths versus total infected patients present. We have several case fatality rates floating around for COVID-19 currently. As of March 11, WHO's official global fatality rate is 3.6%, though it varies by country. South Korea's, for example, is 0.7%, and Italy's 6.2%. These numbers are bound to change and likely go down as it is almost impossible to calculate an accurate fatality rate during an active outbreak. To do that, we need a stable denominator of all active cases, which we do not have yet. In fact, Korea's great numbers could be due to their massive testing campaign catching a lot more symptomatic cases, making the denominator grow and CFR go down. Still, at the global fatality rate of 3.6%, we can see that the proportional number of people dying of COVID-19 can be in the 20 to 30 times range of those dying of the flu. Combine that with the potential for exponential growth we have just talked about, and now I think you understand what the head of Global Health Institute at Harvard has said during a recent interview. I quote, if I hear one more comparison to the flu, I am going to lose my mind. It is not a helpful comparison. This is the best I can do on this topic, folks. And if you are still not convinced that COVID-19 is for real, I don't know what to say. Which brings us to the appropriate response. My take on the current situation is that the leaders of the world are starting to take appropriate lessons here. There are stages of response to any pandemic, which start with containment. This is what we were doing when the virus was still largely in Wuhan. People were being asked for Wuhan travel history, tested, and isolated if positive. Aggressive contact tracing by health authorities led to infected contacts and clusters of the disease be found and locally controlled. As travel unrelated cases spread, however, it became clear that local community transmission was taking place, leading to outbreaks in Iran, Italy, and South Korea. It only spread from there, and it sure started to look like we needed to abandon the seemingly futile containment and focus on the next stage of mitigation instead. The reason the WHO waited so long to declare this obvious pandemic on March 10th is that they did not want countries to give up the prevention efforts and move to mitigation automatically. As the chief of the WHO said two days ago, there is still time to stop this epidemic. WHO sees what is happening in South Korea and Singapore at what happened with China, which brought this under control, and says you can still stop it. How? Learn from Italy. 
Do not wait to institute significant social distancing methods until you have hundreds or thousands of new cases every day. Do not be lax in your approach. Italians initially closed businesses but allowed bars and restaurants to be opened. These are now closed as well. Take lessons from both Wuhan and Italy to move on this thing now and cancel everything. This is why I fully support and am not surprised by the cascading school closures around New York and predict that this strategy will only go further. We are not China, so I doubt that draconian do not leave your house measures will be instituted here, but I do predict closures of movie theaters, malls, the New York City subway system, and the New York City schools in the next two weeks. All it will take is a spike of new cases and the government will be forced to act. Based on the above, I view it as a necessary measure and nothing to feel anxious about. Community mitigation is the next stage of pandemic response, usually used once the local community transmission is suspected. There are layers of response delineated in this 2017 CDC document and range from personal self-isolation to cancellation of public events. Here's the main table from the document. We need to know that this document was created for influenza and that SARS-CoV-2 virus is different, but I think the authorities are following this document for now. Mitigation measures are all about social distancing or putting space between people so they do not give each other the virus. Home self-isolation of sick people is the first step and stopping all activity in the area like they did in Wuhan and now Italy is the last. Suspending the NBA season is a uniquely American contribution to the response. One graph answers that question, and here it is. We need to slow down the rate of infection in any community so we do not overwhelm its resources. I am sure you understand that there are only so many hospital beds, ICU beds, and respiratory ventilators in whatever part of a country you live. We call it healthcare capacity, and it has a limit. What I believe happened in Hubei province, where Wuhan is, as well as in Italy, is that this peak was reached exceeding capacity and exhausting the local resources to help people. That is why the death rate was so high there. Look, the minute that Wuhan built new hospitals and got its act together, the mortality there dropped and reached a much lower level of the rest of China. So wherever you live, your political leaders have one job now, to mitigate the outbreak of this disease to prevent reaching this line and spread the outbreak over time so there's always enough ventilators available. I support them in that 100%. And again, that is why we need to cancel everything. Stop watching the news. I have. There is a major problem in our lives right now, and it is the evening news. Built for ratings, the editors of the TV segments and internet sites alike have a job to do, and it is to capture attention. They do it via serious looking graphics, lots of red, and grim tone reporters updating us on the latest developments. We are living through a historic moment, and the radical virus precautions we are taking are warranted. But let us please not get caught up in the TV editor's drama and focus on what's in front of us. A public health threat with some inconveniences ahead, but a threat that we will meet, deal with, and resolve. There are two audiences I make these videos for, the general public and my patients, who are generally older. The 90 is the new 80 is the mantra of my practice, so to my wonderful octogenarians and above, please stay safe by staying away from crowded places and by washing your hands. There is a WHO document just for you and I will include the link below. I am always here to answer your questions and you know where to call. To everyone else stressed out by this event, please consider the following. There's a whole group of people out there that will have to be careful. But unless you are over 70 years old or have several significant conditions such as diabetes, COPD, hypertension, or congestive heart failure, you can really, truly relax. As we have discussed in the last video, the death rates of the younger people are tiny. As I mentioned earlier, these rates will probably drop even further as the denominator full of mild cases grows and overall fatality rate drops. So, what's coming next? Social distancing to the max, that's all. 
most schools will close, many of us will work from home, and, depending on how it goes, some stricter quarantines may be put in places. National Guard will likely hit the streets, even checkpoints may appear to limit travel and keep virus cases down. Understand that this may be coming, shrug your shoulders at the next news segment breaking into your regular show, and get some extra food in the fridge. This thing will continue to grow for a while, peak, and start subsiding. Treat it as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to step back from your crazy fast-paced life, slow down, and gain a whole new perspective on how good we have it otherwise. Enjoy the quarantines, everyone. I plan to read The Hobbit to the kids.